Hi, my name is James and today on Quick Economics we're going to be looking at market research. Obviously I'm going to be answering the question what is market research but I'm also going to show you how different types of market research um, are classified and I'm going to go through a couple examples with you as well. So a defini uh, <laughs> definition of market research that you could uh, potentially use is the process of gathering and interpreting data about customers and competitors within an organization's target market. So there's a few words in, in this definition that I've underlined and I'm going to go through these uh, in a second. Um, so yeah, the first part of market research is the process of gathering information. So there are many ways that you could go about gathering information. But a few that I'm going to go through today are surveys and questionnaires, focus groups and interviews, and observation. Also, market research is about customers and competitors. By conducting market research with customers and finding a little bit more about them, then we can hopefully better meet customer needs to increase sales. Um, the way we might go about this is by finding out information so, um, such as how what they think of our product or our prices and then use this information to make certain changes which will lead to better meeting our customer needs by finding out what they actually are. So yeah, basically you're going to find out customer needs, take action and hopefully better meet them. So we can also look at um, competitors, we can look at their prices and quality of uh, say goods that are similar to us. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that we find out that our rival pineapple store is charging £1 for a pineapple and we're charging £2 for a pineapple. Well, it's no wonder we're not getting many sales. We're charging twice as much as them. However, if we then uh, do a bit more research and try to learn more about, say, the quality of their pineapples, uh, customer service, that sort of thing, then we can sort of set a benchmark uh, of what we should possibly charging be charging because perhaps maybe our pineapples are high quality so a price something of something like £1.25 might be more suitable so although we're more expensive we're giving better customer service high quality products that sort of thing that um, customers are willing to pay that little, little bit extra for so we've uh, also got to look at our target market if we produce dairy products like cheese or ice cream then researching the market for stationery isn't going to help us at all so perhaps we're looking at expanding into the stationary market. So now it is useful, but this also means that the stationary market has now become one of our target markets. Because we're aiming to, we're targeting people within a market. We're trying to do research about them so that possibly we can sell to them. That's now our target market because we're targeting people in that market. So now we've worked through what market research is, I'm going to go on to a way to classify different types of research. So we've got primary and secondary research. Um, so as the name may suggest, primary research is new research. It hasn't been done before by anyone else. Because of this, it's up to date and it isn't like old information that's perhaps not relevant today. It's up to date and hopefully this means it's more accurate and representative of today's market conditions. This is the opposite to secondary research, which is research that's already been conducted, it's been done before. And it's also research that we haven't done. An example of this could be looking at other companies' survey results. Obviously they probably won't let us, but perhaps we could do that. That's just an example. Perhaps seeing on the news that house prices are rising, and then deciding to buy to let so you get a decent return on your investment. This isn't a solid example of market research, um, but hopefully it, it, um, it helps you to understand that secondary research is looking at information that others have already found. We just looked on the news, uh, we haven't gone out and sort of checked all of the prices and looked at certain statistics. Someone else has already gone and done that uh, a few weeks ago possibly and found that information out for us. Because of this, it's often quick, easy and cheap to get secondary research. But because it's done by others, it may not be relevant to us. Um, so perhaps, as is the same thing, it finds out uh, 
about ho house prices. Prices, sorry. Um, so that's not really going to be very relevant to their market. It's not really going to help out. It's not relevant to them. You could argue, perhaps, that if we look at uh, how fast house prices are rising, then people's uh, disposable income is falling, and thus they might spend less at Asda. Um, however, this is this is like very will have a very small effect. It's going to be quite insignificant, and it's very hard to deal with this sort of information. So it mu makes much more sense for perhaps Asda to do its own market research to find out relevant information. If it can't find out any relevant information that's already available to it. Um, so back to primary research. Um, it's normally done by us, by the business. Um, that means the information collected uh, hopefully is going to be relevant, unlike secondary research. And because of this, it it's hopefully going to answer whatever question that we want it we want to answer when we decide to do market research. So we may have thought, well, why are people buying pineapples from our competitor? Well, we go out and we find, we do, say, a survey, look at their prices, certain things. And we find out, well, it's because they're so much cheaper than us. We've sort of answered that question. So, uh, because we're doing the research, though, we don't always have to, but because we could pay someone else to do the research for us, it's still technically primary research. But either way, it's going to cost us money and it's going to take time to do. Uh, and the better the research you want, the more it's going to cost us. But I'll talk about the, this very shortly. But just for now, I'm going to move on to the next way to classify market research, which is quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative uh, means not lots of T's, but it means numerical data. So maybe 100 people say that they would buy our new flavour of crisp. Uh, crisps, packet of crisps, and 120 people say no. We could represent this data graphically, perhaps on a pie chart or a bar, bar graph, bar chart, sorry. Um, so we can get quantitative data by asking respondents to pick from choices that we offer them, so closed questions. This could be, um, say, asking them, would you buy our new packet of crisps? Would you enjoy this flavour? Or asking them to rate it from a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, another example could be, say, asking a customer to rate their shopping experience with us from a scale of 1 to 10. The respondent can only choose from numbers 1 to 10. They can't say, oh, I've really enjoyed this experience. Um, the cashiers, they were so kind and helpful. And drumming really helped me out because I got a little bit confused with the prices. So information like this is called qualitative data. Again, a lot of T's. But um, it's information about people's feelings and opinions. We can't turn it into a graph. So again, it's a little harder to deal with this type of data. but it's, And it's also going to take a lot longer to look at the answers. But this is because there's a lot more information, a lot more things we can look at in the response. If we didn't ask these sort of open-ended questions, like how did you find your shopping experience today? then we might not have ever found out that our employees are giving great customer service. We might have assumed that we're charging good prices or that everything's okay when the reality could be that this customer found the customer service so good that they were willing to buy, pay high prices that perhaps if we lowered, we could get m loads more people into our store because they're not scared off by high prices or anything like that. So uh, now I'm going to move on to some examples. Um, of market research so first of all is questionnaires and surveys uh, hopefully you'll be familiar with this it's quite simple it is very obvious um, but it's basically where we're going to ask uh, specific questions and we're going to get answers to those questions so we could ask customers to fill out a survey perhaps when they leave a store or in the streets or we could also ask them to do it online uh, in digital form Hopefully we're going to get a mix of qualitative and quantitative data because we're going to ask a mix of closed questions and open questions. So, for example, we might ask questions such as Do you like our new crisp flavour? How was your experience in our store? And then, <laughs> that's an open question, sorry. We're going to ask questions like What would you rate our crisp from 1 to 10? 
what do you think of our customer service on a scale of 1 to 10? And then also ask them if they have any comments about our customer service. We could leave, say, open boxes for them to fill in if they have any comments they'd like to leave. But hopefully we're going to get a different sort of mix of data from this. Um, so another method is observation. JD Sports have used this method to make uh, a few business decisions. And what they did was they had staff look at people's carry bags that they bought into the store. So this uh, can be simply called the shopping bag survey. And it let JD see what type of products and retailers customers liked. But do you know many people that were coming into JD also liked other certain products? W what sort of things they liked outside of JD? So if loads of people come into the store and they have full shopping bags from Debenhams, then JD might decide to open a few more stores near other Debenham stores because maybe we're going to get a lot more sales because the sort of people that like to shop in Debenhams also like to shop in JD's so if we build a store next to Debenhams they'll probably visit us as well we're going to get a few more sales um, so that's what JD's sort of hoping when they make these sort of decisions um, a few other things we could do which I've written down we could do something more internalized so we don't have to involve customers as much we could just look at what items are we selling a lot of if we're not selling many much brown breads but we're selling loads of cookies well let's try to maybe advertise our cookies uh, raise the price a bit or just produce more of them and put less attention on our bread so the last method I'm going to talk about are focus groups or alternatively interviews but basically a focus group is kind of like an in-depth interview but we're going to talk to quite a few people about a new product a new marketing te marketing technique or something something along those lines um so this is going to be primary research because we're going to be doing this ourselves this isn't something that we can look at another business's focus group results because they're not going to share that with us and we want we want this information to be really relevant to our product to our new service, to our new whatever it is. We want to get kind of a good opinion of our product, something specific to us. Uh, so because of this, we're going to tend to ask a lot of open-ended questions, like, uh, what do you think of um, the name of our new pro uh, our new packet of uh, crisp flavour? Do you, do you think this is a catchy name? Or just tell us what you think, because we want to know, we want to get a better idea of what our customers are thinking. So obviously we're going to get qualitative data, but there's no point of going through all this effort of setting up a focus group and then just asking a couple of yes or no questions. It's not going to get us quantitative data, if I can say that right. Um, so yeah, an in, obviously an in-depth interview is a great way to find out about all sorts of things, like why customers are loyal to our brand, or get a few suggestions from them about things we could change. Um, they might, we might at the end say oh is there anything you'd like to say to us before we finish this interview and then he says you know what I think your prices are way too high and we think you know what maybe we could get a lot more sales if we just lowered our price a little bit um, so we need a lot of people to make this accurate though um, and but that's applicable to a lot of market research as we increase our sample size which is how many people we interview how many people fill out a survey or how many shopping bags we look at in JD whatever it is the accuracy and quantity of the research we're doing is going to go up but so does the cost and time if we only ask one person what they think about our store it's not going to take very long and it's not going to cost us anything either um, but at the same time it's not going to be representative of the market we might have one rude staff member that serves our customer we're asking so we get a really negative review so we think oh our shop's not very good is it people aren't really liking it perhaps we have some other USB but we don't really know what's going on because we this, this is going to skew our data we might have really great staff and one person who's just a little bit iffy so we want to maybe spread our surveys out over the course of a week so we can get a better idea of what our customer service is actually like in general and perhaps get a little bit more information from different parts of the store not just our customer service we want to know about the prices the quality we, we want to know what people think in general so i don't know perhaps you've ever been given a receipt and the the sorry the cashier has pointed out on the back of the receipt or the bottom that if you go online and fill out a survey 
then you can get 50% off your next shop or you get a free cookie or something along those lines. So I'll finish off with a few methods of sampling. Um, so first off, the simplest out of them all, I think, is just volunteer sampling. And this is just using people who are happy to provide information. So you may have seen people on the high streets before and they're trying to get uh, people to come along and fill out surveys. Well, only people that actually want to fill out these surveys will fill it out. I've, you know, I mean, a lot of times people have uh, gone to my dad as we're walking by and gone, oh, you fill out this survey and we've just, we've just walked on past. It's not to be rude, but there's so many people and you're just trying to get as many people as you can to fill out the survey. And obviously this is the e easiest way to do it and probably the cheapest. But at the same time, it's very susceptible to bias. We're only going to get information from people who actually want to give up their time to provide the information. Um, so we're not getting information for perhaps people who are busy or because that might be our target market. We might be serving people who sit at McDonald's who are busy. They just want a quick snack. And we're not because of this, we're not really getting information that's re um, representative of our market. So this isn't always the best way. Something that's uh, sort of counter to this is cluster sampling. And this is where we're going to choose a specific group to do our research with. An example could be, say, asking a year three class from a school what they think of our new toy design. So it should be pretty obvious that because although this is open to a lot of bias, because we're only asking kids, it's open, you know, we could get a lot of inaccuracies. But at the same time, a lot of this bias we want. We don't care what uh, grandads without any grandchildren think. We don't care. We want to know what the kids think of our kids' toys. Um, also, a similar method to this is quota sampling. Instead of choosing groups, we're just going to choose individuals and we're going to base this on certain characteristics. Uh, perhaps age, income or gender. So we might sell yachts, for example. Um, let's just ask people who are really rich if they're thinking of buying a yacht what they think about the design, the luxury, that sort of thing. There's no point asking a five-year-old what they think of our yachts if they like the design. They're five, year old, they're five years old. They're not going to buy a yacht from us. They're not our target market. We don't care. So, again, this is open to a lot of bias because we're asking very specific people. But again, it's bias that we mostly want. The method that I think has uh, the least bias is systematic sampling. And this is basically saying let's interview every 10th person on this list every five per fifth person we see enter our store we're, we're trying to be as random as possible we're going through a system where we go every 10th person every fifth person or whatever we choose but uh, to go along with this we want quite a big sample size um so obviously we're going to get very accurate representative information from this without much bias but at the same time it's going to be really expensive and really time consuming so this is possibly the sort of thing that quite big companies are going to use, perhaps as the Walmart, maybe those type of companies. But anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. It's been a really long episode and it's actually been a bit longer than I had actually intended originally. But if you've made it this far, I really appreciate that you've stuck with me. I really appreciate the support. Um, and in future, I'll actually try to make the videos maybe about 10 minutes long. Because I think that's uh, short enough that it will still be interesting for you guys. That you can still enjoy the content. But at the same time, it gives me enough time to put in all the information, all the content in. That I think is going to be important, that I think I need to cover. Because if I didn't cover the primary and secondary market research, perhaps when I use those terms. In we're going to do the focus groups, there's no point getting others to do it you wouldn't really have as great an understanding. So I just think it's quite important to make them long enough to get the like all the content in that's actually required, for, especially for these economics videos. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. Like I said, it's been a long video. I'll try to make them a bit shorter in future. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.